uh, another Monday, and it's the podcast, uh, the Bob McCowan podcast, yours truly, uh, along with uh, John Shannon. Just the two of us today. Nobody wanted to come on with Shannon. It's hard to understand, but we'll have I'm, to, I'm uh, surprised you did. Struggle through. You're surprised what about, about me? That you wanted to come on. Well, I didn't really, but I sort of have a responsibility to, you know, clothe and feed you. And so... <laughs> Pardon, pardon me. Oh, here I am. Um, we um, we lost a couple of iconic figures on uh, this uh, weekend to um, uh, two Canadians. Mm-hmm. Um, one who has spent uh, the majority of his life in Canada and is uh, probably known um, almost exclusively in this country, and Howie Meeker. And another, um, an Ottawa native, if I'm not mistaken. Sudbury. Uh, Born in Sudbury, raised in Ottawa. Correct. Thank you. Um, In Alex Alex Trebek, who, um, of course, began his broadcasting career in this country with a variety of shows, mostly game show stuff, and then landed um, a a little show called Jeopardy. Um, Yeah. Many, many years ago, uh, which has become... Um, one of the two iconic game shows on American television. And I dare say there's no one watching or listening to us today who is not familiar with the show, who has not watched at least a little bit from time to time. And um, Howie Meeker was 97 correct, years of age, and Alec Trebek was 80 yeah. uh, years of age. And, um, and, and you know, both – well, first of all, uh, both of them uh, got their start uh, in the broadcast world uh, at the CBC. Uh-huh. Um, and, uh, and it, you know, the CBC for the longest time was a, a fertile ground of, uh, of finding and, and creating talent. Uh, you talk about Alex Trebek. Uh, growing up, uh, I grew up in, in British Columbia. And... Uh, the biggest show for kids after school was something, I think it was five or five 30 uh, every day. And it went across the country and it was music hop. There was music hop in Halifax, music hop in Montreal, right. music, music hop in Toronto. And, and Alex hosted music hop in Toronto. Uh, and uh, you knew then that how, how good he was. And he became uh, th- that he was part of my youth on the the way, whether it was the I think it was the Wednesday show that he was just so so darn talented um and and it was at a time uh, at the CBC where you, you know you you did music hop and then you went over and did the weather and you might have done uh, the sports late night you know the 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 what what they described at that time as generalists they were just staff announcers and they did whatever they were assigned to do and and trebek was one of those guys that could do absolutely anything what i didn't know was bob he, he got summoned to los angeles uh, in the early 70s i think 1973 by alan thick mm. uh, another and, canadian another canadian who had gone down there and and thick's resume uh, is unbelievable, a versatile guy, and unfortunately he's passed as well. Um, but Alan Thick would write music. He also created game shows. Uh, he wrote uh, comedies. Alan Thick was a, another versatile guy, and he his his friend Alex Trebek went to Los Angeles to host game shows, and uh, uh, and yet he I think he, he went through he went through like. 10 game shows in the first five or six years he was there mm. uh, before he got Jeopardy in 1984. Well, he did game shows when he was here too. He did Reach for the Top. If you Yeah, I didn't, I never, recall. but Reach, Reach for the Top only in Ontario. He didn't do well, that. Well, whatever. That, yeah, but it, you were right. But he, but uh, again, but he was the staff announcer at that time. And, and one of the reasons he did Reach for the Top is he could do it in English and he could do it in French. Uh, being bilingual, being from Sudbury. So I, but I mean, let's face it, what Trebek was, was, uh, I mean, he, he became so iconic for his preparation uh, and for his delivery and his dry sense of humor. And he's one of those guys that transcends generations. You talked about people who, you know, are watching or listening. 
but there are people that are 15 years old that know Alex Trebek, and there are people that are 85 years old that know Alex Trebek, which is, oh, sure. which is something to be said. Um, so on the subject of Mr. Trebek, uh, I woke up this morning and had CNN on, and literally the first thing I saw was a commercial for some insurance company that I have seen before. And if you watch CNN at all, you probably have seen it as well. And um, it's a commercial that is that features, is hosted by Alex Trebek. Mm -hmm. And I found that, I, I don't know how to react to that. I don't, I don't know whether that is appropriate or inappropriate. Um, I'm there, not... was a, there was a time in our lives that that was inappropriate. Mm -hmm. There, there was a time when there were, and I, I don't mean, to, I don't want to be demeaning about it. There, when there were standards and practices that would take those types of things off the air. Bob, you, you, your, your, your world of radio, the moment, for instance, there was a plane crash, every commercial for every airline was taken off the air. Yeah, immediately. Mm -hmm. Immediately. Um, and, and I, I thought the very same thing last night when they said he's taped enough shows until Christmas. Well, that's the other part of this equation. And, and, um, you and I chatted very briefly about it before we started doing the podcast today. And, um, I don't know how to react to that. I don't know whether that's appropriate or not. How will you feel tonight at whenever Jeopardy comes on seven, seven thirty? We're or usually we're, but depending whatever, on where whatever you're region you're in. No? Yeah. Uh, how are you going to feel tonight, knowing that Alex Trebek has passed, and there he is on, yeah. uh, on your television set? It will be extremely strange. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't. I really don't know. I, I and and the the interesting thing about Trebek, and I, obviously the the family or Alex before he passed would have to say, "Listen, you can run the shows with me on them." Well, it's not a question of legality, John. No, I'm not, no, I'm no, a, no, no. It's no, a question no. of how, how does the audience feel about it, and is it is it the right thing to do? And I don't well, know. But 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 if you go to what Trebek's philosophy was of doing Jeopardy, his his whole intent in this in that time when he was doing the shows, and I, I, in reading some of the stuff this weekend, was to make the three contestants the stars. That was his goal of all this. Fine, but and and and, and, and I'll tell you right now, between you know November the November the ninth and December twenty fourth, when you know the the last show runs, uh, the the three contestants will be immaterial to people watching. And that and 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 yet that and that would contradict, I believe, everything that Alex believes in the show. Well, it's fine and and, and noble that he took that position and um, probably should have taken that position as, as, uh, as all of us should in, if we're put in, in that kind of scenario. But mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is very simple. You cannot name probably a single person that has been on a game show of the millions, and I mean millions of game shows that have aired during our lifetime name one person who was on a contestant on that show can and you? yet we can name we can name many many hosts the host is the star of the show but but the, but the, the the kids the consistency you're right oh no no you're you're, you're absolutely right Trebek can say just, could have said what he wanted to and it's very honorable and noble but it doesn't matter. Well, I believe he is, he's the star. He is the star of that show. The reason we are talking about him today is because he is known as mm -hmm. the, um, the star of that program. Yeah. Um, I still, w um, occasionally, um, will watch a game show that was hosted by someone else previously and think of that person. Hmm. I mean, if I say Richard Dawson to you, what do you think of? Family Feud. Well, Hogan's, Hogan's Heroes, but Family Feud. Yeah. Yeah. And, no, and you're for, right. You know, and, and there have been, well, I don't know, a couple, three, four other hosts since Richard Dawson passed. Well, and, and half the audience will yell Steve Harvey. So, well, because he's there now. Correct. And I'm not suggesting that he isn't good. I'm not even suggesting that he isn't a lot better. 
oh, than no, Richard no. Dawson. Dawson. Dawson was was there a long time, and Dawson was first. So exactly. Yeah, yeah. That is exactly it. So yeah, yeah. But I but but so if you were, uh, it, it it's not on a network. It's in uh, the, It's a syndication the, show. It's yeah. a syndication show. Would you would you run it? John, it's I, I I don't have the answer to that question. You know, it's sort of why I raised the topic, and and with your history as a uh, broadcast executive, um, I'm know, sure that I'm I, sure I, I should be asking you to. that question. If you were running that syndication package, what would you do? Well, the the only way you it, it's interesting. I, not easy answer, is it? No, it's not. It's not um, because uh, again, it goes back to these these people that were on the show. It goes back to what the estate would want. It goes back to, uh, unfortunately, it go uh, a lot of it goes to money too. Uh, a lot of it goes to how much money it will earn and how much money. I mean, the one thing that uh, Trebek has has been quoted a great deal about is he, he did so much to try to make sure that his family was set for life in this last 17 or 18 months. Yeah. That's why he wrote a book. He said, I, I did it for, I did it for the money. I, I did it to make sure that my wife uh, and my kids don't have to really do anything for, uh, for the rest of their lives. And by the way, this is a guy that, I mean, we, 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 we probably don't know as much. He donated ten million dollars to the University of Ottawa. Uh, you know, he he. I would argue, he might be the most successful Canadian entertainment person ever. That moved from our country to the United States. You know, there's a few guys. Lauren Michaels would be on that list. Uh, I think the list but, is pretty long. Oh no, it's a long list. But I mean, and, when you think. They- I mean, I, I don't, and I, I, you know, I'm just speaking anecdotally, but I, 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 when you look at the impact of a guy, when you look how much money they've made, I mean, holy smokes, this guy, this guy did a, did a ton. And, and let's face it, it I, I truly believe never forgot where he came from, you know, was a, you know, was a fan of the Ottawa Senators. Look what he did at the NHL draft this year. Well, yeah, I was going to bring that up too. I know? mean, my I goodness mean, gracious. That was uh, like a month ago, six weeks ago. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's right. Whatever. Yeah, I mean, and, and and I mean, good. I mean, for him to have done that, and whose ever idea it was, uh, that that was absolutely uh, fantastic to see that. And that's a, it. Was sad. It was sad to to see him go. But uh, the the question of watching him between now and Christmas is going to be a very interesting one. Because you end up saying, is that a wig? Is he wearing a wig? What's he doing? How is he feeling? You know, all that stuff. Um, the other gentleman we lost will not be as familiar to our audience or to some or maybe even many in our audience. Um, because he was, well, 17 years older than Alex Trebek when he mm-hmm. passed this mm-hmm. weekend. Um, Howie Meeker was 97 years old. And Howie Meeker, it has been some considerable time since Howie Meeker was on, an, on the national stage mm-hmm. as a broadcaster. 23 Alex years. Alex Trebek was on on Friday, if yeah. you wanted to watch him. 23 oh. years ago, yeah, for Howie. There you go. So there's a generation that wouldn't be familiar with uh, Howie Meeker. But I do recall Howie Meeker being a fixture in the booth um, for hockey games on uh, Saturday nights and uh, other nights. He was a one of the, um, well, I guess it's safe to say one of the premier color commentators um, in hockey broadcasting of the time, wasn't he? Analyst. I, I'd call him an well, analyst. That, okay. he, because his, str- his, strength, his strength, Bob, was between periods. His strength was to sit with, you know, whether it was Hodge or Steve Armitage or John Wells. Uh, his, his strength was to sit there and, and he was the first in many ways to, to break down a game, to break down tape, uh, uh, of why things happen and what, sh- and more importantly for Howie, what should happen. You know, he, um, you know, he didn't invent the telestrator, but he used the telestrator to great effect. And, uh, 
and then he did it he, he did it with bravado that was the other thing that uh, you know i uh, my history with the show with hockey night was such that if if you looked prior to Howie's real development in the in the early to mid seventies, Hockey Night was a very very staid, shirt and tie, you know, Ward, Jack Dennett, well Ward uh, Cornell, Eddie Fitkin, I mean, you know, all those even and even our friend Brian McFarland, they were you know people. There's a lot of people going to say the show stayed anyway, but but Howie was the first one that jumped out from behind that i'm just going to have wear a simple you know shirt and tie howie was the one who put emotion on the air um and and ch- in many ways changed what intermissions were supposed to be oh 100% and and you know um it's it's impossible to create a link between howie meeker and don cherry because they are they had two entirely different approaches um, totally but how he was energy, he always had a twinkle in his eye. He usually had a smile on his face. He had this, you know, I mean, I know his voice wasn't all that high pitched, but every once in a while he would go into this little, when he got excited, you know, yeah. holy cow. And, 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 you know, and that was, that was how he's style. Yeah. And um, it, it jumped off the screen for you, as you said, because those surrounding him, to be quite honest, had very little personality. They stayed in their lane. Howie didn't stay in his lane. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the, so, so now we should we should mention that this guy um, was the was a, a four time Stanley Cup champion as a player. Yeah. Former coach of the Maple Leafs for a very short period of time until he punched Stafford Smythe. Um, which might have been warranted, uh, by the way. Uh, and then, uh, and, and had a real entrepreneurial spirit too. You know, ended up owning bowling alleys in in Newfoundland before moving to Parksville and getting back into television. Um, you know, so there are the thing about what what Howie was. What you the Howie that was Howie. That was the real deal. I worked with Howie for more than a decade. Um, and, and I, I knew he had a, I knew he had a temper, but not once in the time that I was with, with, with and around Howie, Howie never got mad at anybody. Howie loved life. And how, Howie, Howie was one of those guys you'd go out for dinner or you'd see him in the morning and Howie always had something to say and to have fun. And, and then went to the rink and was mobbed by fans. How he became the, the first guy. And I, there is, a, there is a link between Meeker and Cherry uh, in that because of Meeker's success, the guy who really put Meeker on that mantle, Ralph Mellenby said, we need to do more of that. And the next step after Meeker was Don. What what a lot of people don't realize is that uh, when when Howie moved west, uh, and Don joined the show, uh, Don wasn't seen nationally on a regular basis until four or five years after. Really, I, I, even was, I didn't know that. Hockey night was well, there were no double headers in hockey night until 1995. Right. So, so there was a regional game in the west, and there was a regional game in the east. Uh, and for the most part, uh, when we did how, uh, and I was the producer in the West, when Howie was in the West, Don was in the East. So there was, there became a little bit of a, a little bit of a competition between mm. the East show and the West show and between Howie and Don, uh, about, uh, uh about th- how to do things. And then in 1986, uh, Howie left and then Don was on every Saturday night constantly in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in both Western Canada and in the East. So, but, but, but how he, listen, how he was just, he was the real, real deal. He was just a fantastic person. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's funny, uh, Kelly Rudy told a story, uh, one Saturday night about, uh, gosh, uh, I guess a year ago about the night we met, we were with Howie in 2006 or 2007. 
Uh, and uh, Kelly, Kelly was brave enough to put him back on the air with them. He, he and uh, I think Scott Oak had him on the air in, in one of the intermissions. And uh, I happened to be there. I was working for the NHL at the time, happened to be there. And Howie was on and was fantastic. I mean, and, and, and so in 2006, Howie's, gosh, what is he? He's, so he's 84, 85. And uh, at the end of the segment, uh, you could you could literally see Howie tearing up uh, because of what you talked about earlier. There's a generation of people that don't know Howie Meeker. And you get to a point in a stage in your life where you're worried that you're forgotten. Mm. And uh, it really meant a lot to Howie to, to be put on the air on Hockey Night in Canada on a Saturday night in Vancouver. Uh, and uh, he literally, as we left the uh, arena, he said, uh, it's, uh, I didn't think you guys remembered me. Wow. Uh, and, uh, but his impact, and you talk, talk to people in British Columbia where he was a regular guy doing Canuck games for a long time. His impact on the game uh, and how people liked the game and approached the game. How he was, how he was a, an influential person. Maybe subliminally, but he was an influential person. Well, to a, um, a generation, um, Alex Trebek and Howie Meeker will uh, indeed be missed. We, we had a bunch of football games, of course, this weekend, as we do uh, every weekend. And one of the things that struck me, I was listening to one program or watching, I can't remember which, and um, there was a noticed deferential treatment for uh, Tom Brady, which is deserved as probably the greatest quarterback to ever play the game. And I'm a big Brady fan. Um, but if I was to say to you that the second best quarterback and maybe even not by very much in the National Football League is Drew Brees, I don't know how many people would be able to argue that legitimately i know there are other great ones out there rogers has you know had a great career and you but well, the numbers the, but the numbers alone put brady breeze brady breeze breeze brady you know well and and i i have i've uh, i've often gone back and forth in in trying to figure out which one i think i would rather have and statistically in terms of championships and victories um brady wins that battle Mm -hmm. And yet I fully understand that as good as a quarterback is and how integral he is to success, uh, it, it is, it, the difference may only be who surrounds that quarterback. Right. And, and Brady's um, entourage of extras, if you will, has clearly been superior to Breeze's. That having been said. But I tell you what, they both had revolving doors of wide receivers, Bob. They both sure have. Oh, 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 I mean, oh. I mean, there are times oh, where Brady, there are times where Tom Brady doesn't deserve to be in a game when he's got the no-name receivers. I get it. 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 Um, you know, and it goes back to the age-old question: How many championships do you have to win to be considered great? And I've always thought that Dan Marino was one of the five best quarterbacks in the history of the National Football League. And you know how many championships he won? None. None. Went to a Super Bowl. Would you rather have second. Brady Breeze or Dan Marino? Um, well, that's a great question, isn't it? Um, look, no, I, I, think it's I a, the answer is I, uh, the, the, I, I'll take the other I don't two, know. The other two before him. You'll take who? I'll take Breeze or Brady. You can you over tell Marino? me what, over Marino. Sure. Well, go ahead. Um, I, and I would say throw a blanket over them and, and, you know, let me blindly pick one out and whichever one comes out from under the blanket, I'm okay with. So, um, so we see this matchup yesterday and, and the consensus is, well, Brady's the better quarterback. Tampa Bay is the better team. Um, this is going to be one-sided. Well, it was, Yeah, it was definitively one-sided, but not in the direction that the prognosticators that I was watching or listening to anticipated for the second time this year breeze kicked brady's ass mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And is that all because Breeze had a better game than Brady? No, of course not. But this is a very good Tampa Bay team. It is also a Tampa Bay team whose defense was lauded at the beginning of the year as one of the best in the National Football they play, and, they, and they have played well. As a general rule, they've had a couple of kind of stinker games, but Breeze ripped them apart. Mm-hmm. And it was New Orleans' defense that shut down Brady um, almost completely. And I, th- I thought their pass rush, I, I, I could not believe how effective their pass rush was. Wow. Which was is more, which I wonder, is that more of a statement of, of New England's offensive line? Uh, you, you know, I mean, Tampa's offensive oh, Sorry, Tampa. Yeah, sorry. Tampa's oh, I get it. After line. 20-something years, you know. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, was it more of a statement of that? It, I, it, you know, both will probably make the playoffs. Both teams will probably oh, make sure, the playoffs. Oh, sure. It appears that way. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, the, the tools I, – I, I actually think that New Orleans may have more offensive tools, too, than, than Tampa Bay. Uh, well, that's intriguing because at the beginning, you know, I, I have to confess this, and, and I, um, until last year, Tampa Bay was a sad sack team, and I wouldn't watch them or pay any attention to them. I just, they were bad. Last year, they kind of, kind of emerged as maybe a team on the rise. And then you add Gronk, and you add Brady, and the few other pieces that they added, and I wouldn't have disagreed if asked at the beginning of the season, do you think Tampa Bay is the team to beat, in the, at least in the NFC? I would have probably concurred with most prognosticators and said, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, you can make that case. And you still can make that case. One game does not change a season, as you well know. But to dismiss New Orleans, who have been – kind of a perennial um, second choice, second best. Um, always well, they're, Listen, they're, they were, they're, they're, in many ways, Bob, they're kind of like the Atlanta Braves of football. They are very much like the Atlanta Braves. Yeah. You know, they won one Super Bowl. They have been competitive a great deal of time, and they've lost a lot of close games in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. You know, which, which, if I had, if I had done that uh, with winning a championship and come close a lot, you would have said, "Well, are you talking about the Atlanta Braves?" Uh, and that's that's really that, well. And our ways, friend Stan Castle was are. on last week, which brought to mind the Los Angeles Dodgers, who hadn't won a World Series in uh, God knows how many years. Nineteen eighty-eight, I think. Yeah. Years. And um, and yet, you know, who's been more successful over the last seven years than the LA Dodgers? in terms of regular season playoff performance or playoff appearances, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They just hadn't captured the brass ring. And yeah. you get that. Yeah. You know. But what, what's really neat about what's really neat about Brady breeze, because I don't think, and, and, and you, you'd correct me because you always do. Um, if, Probably if do. I'm right. Yeah. But to watch these two guys play every week and every week, the records change because they're yeah, they active something. and playing and they do something. Yep. So we go from, you know, career touchdown passes, career yardage. I don't think, I, I really don't think in my lifetime in, in the national football league or any sport really, have we seen career statistics grow and career records grow on a weekly basis. I, I don't think we have. Do you it, w- w- it come to mind of anybody? I mean, I mean, we. Well, how often? How often in the history of the game have we seen two forty-plus-year-old quarterbacks, not only active at the same time, but prominent at well, the same time? So, so I'm going to really date myself. So, when I was a kid, at the same time that I was watching Alex Trebek and all those guys. It w- this was Johnny Unitas versus Bart Starr. I was gonna, that's exactly where I was going to go. But, so, but but they were great quarterbacks, but they didn't have the records like these guys. No, but they weren't great quarterbacks when they were forty years old. Johnny Unitas was more, no, he wasn't. Was, no, you're right. You're right. Was a, Thir- was, basically a backup. 
and yeah. basically handed the ball off. Yeah. I mean, it was the era of the running back. But, and, but, yeah, but Brady, but Brady Breeze to see two prompts. Never seen anything like this. I don't think we have. I really don't. Which no. makes me wonder that it, are we going to have we are we going to see it? You know, fifteen years from now, and we're still watching Russell oh, Wilson. No, I and think Josh Brady Allen. and Breeze will be done fifteen years from now, John. I <laughs> could be wrong. Oh, oh God. But are I you, suspect you, that at age fifty-eight, sure? Tom Brady will finally hang him up. Do you remember? Do you remember again? I'm going to date myself, but do you remember when we all thought George Blanda was older than dirt, and 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 George Blanda uh, was the backup quarterback for the Raiders. That was my. Well, you're going to go Houston, to the he game. Was Houston, with, yeah. Yeah. Any, anyway, so no, just the fact that we're, these guys are close to his age. And when you take a picture, I, I challenge anybody to go to the internet and take a picture of George Blanda, who I think played at 44. 45, the, I think. Okay. And, and these guys in their early 40s. And you look at a picture of Blanda, he looked like their grandfather. <laughs> I mean, hey, look, you know me, Cleveland Browns fan. Um, I thought it was a miracle that Lou Groza was still kicking field goals at age 45. I mean, he's kicking field goals, you know, okay, you know. I'm not saying that I could kick field goals at age 45 in the National Football League since I couldn't do it at age 25. But um, is this, do we have to do another contest? Different thing from is this, is this another contest that you have to do? You can't get the ball out of the infield. You can't kick a field goal. You can't do any of that? No, this, these are things that you say that have never been proven, and right. I know I can still do them. I'm not sure. Well, no. I, no. Well, well any time. <laughs> Any, any time, pal. Um, in any event, I look at. I, I am not here to suggest that the Breeze Brady showdown yesterday proves a damn thing. It no. doesn't. Yeah. It is simply an acknowledgement of a couple of things. Number one, they are both great quarterbacks. Brady was not great yesterday. He was crap. But we, Brady is allowed to have the odd bad day. Drew Brees was essentially, by many, written off um, as being too old, over the hill, you know, not quite good enough, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, he stuck it to those guys yesterday. Boy, did he ever. So um, a couple of other things quickly here. How are we doing for time here? Well, I guess we're okay. We're going to spend. What, 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 what? We have to go to commercial? Yeah, we wish. <laughs> Um, I miss those eight minute breaks. Yeah. We ought to just take we ought to take an eight minute break in the middle of uh of the well, podcast. What and you'd go outside and do some exercise or what? Yeah, that's exactly what I do. Yeah, I go for a walk. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Cut the grass, break oh, the leaves. Yeah. You know, all the stuff I do on a regular basis, John, as you well know. Oh, please. All right, so I watch other people do it. Um the uh we have just gone through, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, uh, the weirdest year of uh, our lives. We're not done yet. Oh, I hear you. But everything that happens now, there's now already a blueprint. Um, in the summertime, there was no blueprint. Everything shut down, and we had no idea what was going to happen, what was should happen. Mm -hmm. Um and everything was kind of tweaked. The NBA tweaked the rest of their season and went into a bubble. The NHL tweaked the rest of their season and went into two bubbles. Um, we now have the National Football League playing, but with either no fans or sparse attendance. We have college football that you try and figure out college football you better pay attention because every conference is doing something different by the way what conference is notre dame in now none no notre they're dame in the ac they're in the acc this year oh they are yeah what oh, a I game didn't. that was saturday night when they beat clemson in overtime didn't didn't watch it oh was, and then and and then the then otherwise the, occupied john as, as they say oh but and then you know 15,000 college students racing onto the field. So anyway, um, my point is that we have gone through this whole thing. And at the end of it, it's not normal, but it's, we pretty much have accepted 
what has gone on. We're not particularly angry that they've done it the way they've done it. We may not agree with all the moves that have been made, but generally speaking, you know, about as normal as you can get. Don't like a 60-game baseball season, but it, at least it was held during the baseball season. Um, the Masters hmm. is, um, and, and I will preface this by saying that you and I are golfers, so we understand, and the Masters means a lot more to us than it does to somebody who doesn't play golf. I, I suspect that if you don't play the game, the Masters is um, almost irrelevant to you. Golf is that kind of sport. But the Masters is April. The Masters is sign that spring is at hand. Mm -hmm. And the golf season is coming. Um, the Masters is azaleas in bloom. Uh, the Masters is so many things that are societal as much as they are sporting. And um, the meaning of that <clears throat> many times transcends what actually happens on that unique piece of property, which I have visited in downtown Augusta on Washington Avenue. Mm -hmm. uh, and here it is, the middle of November, and the Masters is about to begin. Sure. And I have no idea what it will look like. Uh, I have no idea whether, um, it, I mean, I'm, I know it's going to be green. Will the, can they get the greens as fast as they normally are? Um, will, the, will there be any flowers in bloom? And these are all things that don't really matter at the end of the day, but we're about to see something that is going to be dramatically different. And I, I always got excited for Master's Week. You know, 40-plus years in this business, Master's Week meant a whole bunch of things. Sure it did. It's summer's coming, you know, winter's over. Uh, I'm about to get my golf clubs out, uh, blah, 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 blah. It's the opposite, man. I'm playing golf tomorrow. And um, almost assuredly, it will be the last time I play this year. Mm -hmm. Can't go anywhere. Uh, and it's Masters Week. What do you make of all this? Like, is this strange for you too? Oh, no, no, I, it, it is because, um, first of all, the, the way the golf season has gone in the last decade, it's, it's a little strange anyway. I mean, you know, the new season starts, doesn't start with the tournament of champions in January. Oh, yeah, I don't worry. But it starts about in that. December. That's, no, that's but it's all about buildup, but it's all about, to me, it's all about buildup to, to that first, you know, the, 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 that first week in April in Augusta. It's about watching weekly, early in, in uh, watching the California part of the tour and then a bit of the Florida tour before they get to Augusta. To me, that's, that's the buildup of the game. Um, it, it, it's strange. I mean, I, I, I must admit with what's gone on in the last uh, three weeks, I, I mean, I know that the season has started on the PGA Tour. But I'm not cognizant of it. In previous years, with Masters Week being at first tent pole, you were always cognizant of what was going on in in, in the PGA, and uh, so it's it's going to be difficult to. I get I, I'm going to I'm going to like it. I'm going to I'm going to be thrilled to be watching it on Thursday. I actually wondered about what the par three uh, competition is going to be like on Wednesday without not fans. It. Well, without fans, because the they're... fans made it. But the fans made it. Yeah, but it. I don't think they're even having the par three yeah. competition yeah. last I saw. But that actually became part of the whole magic of the week. Well, sure it did. Um, look, uh, my perspective is different from yours. I, I don't care. You know, the FedEx Cup, the, the invention of the FedEx Cup um, what? dictated that they, had, they wanted to end their season um, in the fall and start a new season right away in the fall. And yeah. I never looked at it that way. I mean, the first event of the year is the first event of the calendar year, and that's Hawaii. Mm -hmm. and, and generally speaking, the top name guys don't go or rarely go to Hawaii. So it's a bunch of good players and, and, and they play two weeks, I think in Hawaii. And, and then they come back to North America and it, it, all of that builds sure. to one thing. To Augusta. the masters. That's right. It builds to Augusta. Yeah. Once Augusta's over now, there's, you know, you now have the PGA moved number two. Well, it was anyway. And then, 
the U.S. and the U.S. Well, Open, it, British Open. Yeah, and then you go, but now you got the Players Championship in there too, so you really do because that's become uh, that's okay. with that. Oh, that's become a factor, Bob. Well, yeah, that's but again, that's, that's manufactured, John. They're all Bob. They're all manufactured. Yes, I, I know, but historically, it's I mean, manufactured. You wait, know, wait, wait, Augusta on, Nationals Masters, been going the, since 1934, I think. Well, the British but, Open, U.S. Open are, are 100 years plus old. The PGA Championship is just about as old. Um, and, and the TPC, while an interesting oh, tournament, no, are you kidding me? is really the PGA's No, it's the players. Effort. It's the player. It's the player's version of trying to get their share of the pie. That's what it is. That's my point. But, but That's my point. But fifty years from now, remember who runs the other. Remember who runs the other four major or the four major championships. Well, it, it, and that's right because none of the PGA runs none of them. <laughs> that's correct. Augusta <laughs> is a private event. Sure. The U.S. Open is run by the United States Golf Association. Yeah. The PGA duh, is run by the Professional Golfers Association of America, and the British Open is run by the RNA. So where these are all tour events, sure, but none of them are the property of the PGA Tour. So they created their own event. Right. And because they are a monolith, they are have been allowed to promote this as a great event. But with, it has become I a great event. the opportunity to, or, or proposed opportunity, to make it a major championship, suddenly make five majors. Well, you know, know I see through happen. that. I like the TPC. But that's a con job. Okay. Wouldn't, you, wouldn't you just love sitting at 17 and watching them hitting balls into the water? I didn't say that. I didn't say I wouldn't. Come on. What do you, I, you I'd, know, love, I'd love to be on the tee at 17 hitting Bob balls. Bob McCowan, get off my lawn. What is that? Come on, man. You're a progressive thinker. No, I just recognize. I, I don't have. There's nothing wrong with the TPC. But do not try and tell me that it is anywhere near a major championship. It's not, and I I know I've watched since it was developed, and knew right from the beginning exactly what the agenda and motive was of the but PGA Bob, Tour. The reason the reason it's, it has to be considered that is it gets a better group of players almost than anything else. I mean, the only one I think has that comes closest. Well, why, John? Because because it's theirs. Because they own it. Because. The entries of each of those other tournaments is not controlled by the PGA Tour. Therefore, a significant number of PGA Tour players don't get in all the other ones. You don't get into the Masters unless you, well, I mean, there's a whole, the list of, cat, of ways you get into the Masters is that long. Sure. You win a tournament in the past 12 months, you get in. You are historically, Mike Weir is going to play in the Masters. Well, he should. He won. Well, I'll give him two aside. You know, so, you know, I mean, he doesn't deserve to be there other than he won the Masters. Sure, he Doug oh, Ford, played, Doug Ford, played, Doug Ford played in the Masters until, <coughs> excuse me, he was in no, his there's, 80s. There's, there's the other Doug Ford. Come on. The other Doug. But hold on, Bob. A guy who loves tradition and you don't think a Masters winner should be in it? I mean, was there anything better than having Gary Player and Jack? I did not say Arnie? I don't think he should be in it. Uh, but I saw yeah, on, you, you are, on a you. website this morning an article about Mike Weir and how well he's playing. And how, who knows, maybe at 50-whatever-years old, years old, Mike Weir can repeat his master's victory. Give your head a shake. Give your head a shake. So who's going to win the master's? Well, we're going to talk about that on Wednesday. Oh, okay. All right. Um, Lego and perhaps others will uh, join us on Wednesday to discuss. I, I, I merely wanted to point out that it's November. Yeah, and it's, <laughs> it just isn't the same for this. Well, you t tell me that on Monday morning after the guy puts on the green jacket. Oh, you might be right. You, you, you might be right. I mean, I'm going to watch. Sure. Yeah, I've got nothing else to do. I, I'm, I'm going to watch. I'll, I'll pay attention. Um, I'll just be intrigued to see, is the grass as green? Are the greens as fast? What's it like with no people there? Are they going to plant fake flowers? You know. Speaking of watch. I, 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 Are you going said, where I was going to go? 
Well, no, I, I'll just, I'll just, uh, I'll try to set you yeah, up. Pause this. That'll be a first. The last, was it word? Monday, the last six days, nine of the top 10 shows in Canada, Canada, not the United States, were CNN. Count me on that. I CNN, I, and I, I, I am not exaggerating this. My television has not been off 24 hours a day since Tuesday. And it has rarely, rarely moved from CNN. Yeah. Yeah. Rarely. Uh, and there were many moments that I wanted to throw something at the screen because, um, it was just, they kept repeating the same thing over and over and over and over. How many times did you see? Well, I'm, why am I blanking on his name? The, uh, the guy with the gray hair who was Wolf. at the board. Wolf. No, not Wolf. John King. John King. You know, pushing the, the states. If this, if that, if this, if that, then this happens and that happens. And then yeah, but not there. everybody watches constantly. People are coming in. Well, and but I was. And I mean, I get it. Look, at I get it. I, I get that the news cycle is really a 20-minute cycle, and, uh, and mm. then you just repeat. And if you're on 24 hours a day, that's a lot of cycles you got to go through. Yep. But I was there. I was glued to it. I was afraid I was going to miss something, you know. And I actually missed the call. Saturday morning? Yeah. 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 Now, I got there about five minutes after. I actually saw a tweet that said the Associated Press had called Biden the winner. Yeah. AP was no very idea. aggressive all week. AP was very aggressive all week in calling states. Yeah, well, I, I, and I, I mean, do you know, did AP actually uh, call it before CNN? I don't know. I don't know. Because I know, I know that I've seen on CNN the last few days uh, people suggesting that um, it was CNN who made the call. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Who cares? I'd rather, um, be, I'd rather be right than first. So. I'd rather be right and first. <laughs> yes. So... Um, Saturday night, while you were watching um, Clemson and Notre Dame. I was watching both. Yeah, sure. Uh, there I sat waiting for Biden and Harris to make their, um, their speeches. After uh, CNN, AP, UPI. Does UPI even exist? Anymore? No, no. Say Reuters. Make, Reuters David Thomp make David Thompson happy. Bloomberg, whatever. Yeah. Made their prognostic, or, or they uh, uh, gave, gave um, Biden Harris the victory. And, and I watched the speeches. And I tweeted out a very simple tweet um, at the conclusion of the, of the speeches. And it essentially said, um, oh, I'm paraphrasing. You know, things are back to normal. <laughs> Um, it was as simple as that for me. Um, that doesn't mean it's good. doesn't mean it's certainly not bad. But what I saw on Saturday night was what I expect to see from a politician, particularly uh, the incoming president and vice president of the United States, mm -hmm. um, sane, calm, uh, rational speeches, um, a, a desire to bring the two parties together, especially now when there's so much f faction between the Democrats and the Republicans. Um, and I was, you know, I felt like, you know, thank God, this, this ship that was leaking has finally made it to port where it can be repaired. And, um, well, I mean, I guess I don't have anything more to say other than that. Well, um, I understand you feeling that, and I respect that. My, my problem is, is that there were, and, and 75 million people thought your way. The issue becomes is there were 70 million people that didn't. And, and that's I will address that. that. that that's that is that is that to me is and it, to, to to use your metaphor. Uh, there are there are seventy million people that thought the ship was doing just fine. Yeah, I, I, I look at I get that and 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 here, but here's the reality of that. Um, 
I got to go soon. Was somebody calling? Yeah. Okay. Do you have to go now? Because I'll finish this without you. You know, I can't do this on my own. Okay, do that. You're, no, 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 no. Look, I, I'll try and be brief because you got to go. Um, if one checks the history of presidential elections, um, it should not be a surprise to find that while, uh, while the margin of victory is, is not always close, mm-hmm. um, in terms of popular vote, it rarely is bigger than 5 million. R- rarely bigger. Um, and why? Because 90% of the American population um, made the decision, for whatever reason, that they are either a Democrat or a Republican and will vote that way their entire lives, come hell or high water. Oh, yeah. no, it yeah, means good nothing, what, who, the, who, the, who the nominee is, what they say, what they propose to do, means nothing. 10% of the American population who would be categorized as either weak Democrats or weak Republicans would, would, would normally be categorized as independents. And they are the ones that make that decision. And they made the decision this time. Yep, you're right. So, you know, this whole rhetoric of, uh, yes, Biden got the most votes in, in history and Trump got the second most votes, <laughs> in, votes in history is really nonsense. This is, uh, this is exactly what you, you, you would have predicted. Anything less than that would have been shocking. Yeah. Shocking. Well, let's hope that, uh, let's hope you're correct about the future. Well, we'll see. I, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not prognosticating what Biden and Harris are going to do or what they're going to be able to do. We still don't know where the Senate's going to land. Yeah, yeah. But do remember that if, if the two, if the two Senate seats both go Democrat in Georgia, yeah, then you're going to be 50, 50, you know, who, you know, who breaks the tie? Kamala Harris, the vice president. Yeah. So, um, we have to see how that plays out. Okay. But the rhetoric, the daily stress. It's not over yet, Bob. That part's the not tweets, over. That's not over yet. It, it, it is going to come to an end. Well, but it's not over yet. So I got to go. We'll carry on then, John. And uh, look forward to seeing you on Wednesday if you, uh, if you can squeeze us into your very busy schedule. I'll get back to you. Uh, that's the podcast for today. Prematurely concluded by John Shannon. It's the longest one we've ever done. Well, you wouldn't shut up. Uh, See you Wednesday. Goodbye, everybody.